Hello, my name is Monica McGrath from the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes Data Analysis Center, also known as the ECHO DAC. The ECHO DAC is shared between RTI International and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I serve as the director of the ECHO DAC at Johns Hopkins. I would like to welcome you to the ECHO DAC's video on the use of wearable devices in public health research. This video is the first in a series of videos on wearables and will provide you with a general introduction to the use of wearables, specifically the use of accelerometers, which is one type of wearable. Additional videos will focus on specific topics, including the use of specific accelerometers and the analysis of accelerometer-generated data. The ECHO program has a wearables task force as part of the Positive Health Wellbeing Working Group. This task force has completed a survey of the ECHO cohorts determining past, current, and planned future use of wearables in the ECHO cohorts. It was great to see that there are many cohorts who are currently using wearables or are planning to use wearables in their ECHO cohorts. In addition, the ECHO-Y data collection protocol includes the collection of child and maternal prenatal physical activity as recommended data elements using the accelerometer as the method of data collection. Today, I am joined by Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health faculty who are experts in the use of wearables, including accelerometers in research settings. At the end of our panel discussion, I hope you will have a greater appreciation and understanding of the use of wearables in ECHO and in your cohort-specific research activities. Panelists, can you please take a moment and introduce yourselves and briefly, briefly discuss your specific research interests involving wearables? My name is Ciprian Crenciano. I'm a professor of biostatistics. I've been working on wearable computing for the past 10 years, and I'm a member of the ECHO Data Analysis Center at Johns Hopkins University. My name is Jennifer Schrack, and I'm Associate Professor of Epidemiology, and I work with physical activity and accelerometers in multiple aging studies. My name is Derek Ng. I'm an Assistant Professor in the Department of Epidemiology. I'm a Principal Investigator in the Chronic Kidney Disease in Children study which is a cohort study, and I lead the initiative to measure physical activity using accelerometers. Well, thank you, panelists, for joining today's discussion. Uh, to begin the discussion, Jennifer, can you tell us what is an accelerometer and why are wearables such as an accelerometer used in research settings? Sure. So uh, a wearable can be thought of any type of device that a person can wear uh, that tells us something about their health. So as you can see on the slide that's on the screen, um, there are many accelerometers that are used for both um, research purposes and for um, consumer purposes. So the ones on the left side of the screen are what we think of as consumer grade wearables, things like Fitbit and the Apple iWatch and Microsoft Band. The ones on the right side of the screen are what we think of as research grade accelerometers. These things measure the same things. The ones on the right measure it in more detail. They give us raw acceleration data and they give it to us in a much more detailed format. Okay, great. So an accelerometer therefore is one type of wearable. And now, Chipperine, can you tell us about some research studies that have used both wearables and then specifically accelerometers? Yes, uh, absolutely. So we have witnessed an explosion in the use of accelerometers in particular and in wearable devices in general with many, many different studies that use it. Uh, we have listed several of them uh, on the slide, uh, and I could maybe point to NHANES, to UK Biobank, and... BLSA, some of the studies that we are most familiar with, but there are many, many other studies that are using them, both observational studies and clinical trials. Um, so the explosion is due to the fact that we are very interested in uh, measuring um, activity data objectively. Okay, so accelerometers are currently being used in a lot of research studies for this objective measure of physical activity or physical inactivity. Now, you mentioned the NHANES study. Can you speak a little bit more about your experience with the NHANES study? Yes, we worked uh, on NHANES study quite a bit, and uh, you have 
uh, we, we looked at especially at activity and how activity predicts mortality. We took the data from NHANES and we did uh, an analysis on five-year mortality. We took many of the typical predictors of mortality, including several predictors derived from activity research, especially from uh, wearable activity tracker worn at the hip. And we simply ranked the activity predictors from the most predictive to the least predictor, least predictive. And what we observed is that uh, measures derived from uh, wearable devices are very, very predictive of mortality, more predictive than traditional predictors, uh, including age and smoking and uh, diabetes or, or other types of measurements. Um, there are many different types of predictors that can be derived from activity monitors, and it was quite a bit of a surprise to see that uh, this uh, type of measurements are so predictive of, of mortality. And in general, we think that they will be predictive of other diseases. You were saying that accelerometers, right, the subjective measure, but how do accelerometers work? Well, accelerometers are a very, very, it's a so that are very simple devices. So we have actually, uh, right here on the slide, we have a, a particular representation of what an accelerometer is. On the left side of the slide, you can see it's basically a little ball that is suspended in a box. And as you move, uh, the box is moved around, the ball moves inside that box, creating magnetic disturbance. That magnetic disturbance becomes essentially an electric disturbance that is then transform into uh, acceleration forces expressed in uh, Earth gravitational units. Because the movement of the box can be in three dimensions, there are basically three directions in which you can measure acceleration relative to the device. Up, down, left, right, and backwards, forward. Um, in the middle of the slide, you can see that accelerometer being placed on an actual device. It's a very small dot in the middle and the three axes, the blue, green and red, indicates the three axes in which accelerometry will be measured. And then that small little device is actually placed in a consumer grade device or uh, in, a, in a research device like you see on the right hand side. And that is what one wears when we try to, to track activity. So as we conduct different types of activity, the acceleration produced by the body is measured by these devices and it is transformed in, in data. It seems that accelerometers are actually quite complicated with the ability of actually generating lots of data. And now, Derek, you've also used the accelerometer in pediatric settings. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I work on an observational cohort study of children with chronic kidney disease. And if you go to the next slide, um, this is an example of a child with uh, chronic kidney disease. And one of the many complications they uh, experience is um, problems of, of growth as well as uh, cardiometabolic dysfunction. And that cardiometabolic dysfunction, we think, is related to physical activity. And our hope is that if we understand how they move, that may uh, hold some answers to um, understanding the disease better and what we could do to try to prevent progression. So in this longitudinal study, we wanted to understand how they move. And not only how they move in an artificial environment, but also how they move in the real environment, in, in where they live and go about their day-to-day -day lives. Um, the accelerometers that we used allowed us to uh, measure that in this real world environment. Okay, so the accelerometers again providing this objective measure of physical activity. Can you tell us a little bit more about the details of CKID? Sure, um, so CKID is a, uh, a multi-center study with sites all over the US and Canada. Um, this raised some logistical issues um, in terms of getting the devices out and having things standardized um, uh, to measure things objectively. Um, we, I, I, I probably should talk to you a little bit about where we started in terms of physical activity and uh, why we're using the accelerometers now. So there was always an interest in measuring objectively uh, physical activity and how physically active these uh, children are. And uh, 
the first way we opted to measure that was to put two cones in a hallway of the clinic of known distance and have the children walk in laps for six minutes and a coordinator would time, uh, uh, excuse me, count the number of laps that they would make in that six minutes so that we could get an estimate of how quickly they, or how much they walk, could walk in a six minute uh, period. Um, it turned out that this was a disaster. It was a complete <laughs> catastrophe. The, um, uh, the, the protocol was difficult for the children to do because uh, they would get very bored walking for six minutes between two cones. Um, they also didn't like it because it was a little bit humiliating for them when there were other patients in the clinic. Um, we also found that the coordinators had trouble keeping track of how many laps they took because uh, the cones were not that far apart and there would be a lot of laps in six minutes. Um, so that presented a, a problem. When we realized that the, that the data um, wasn't great coming out of that test, we approached uh, Cyprian and Jennifer to help us design a study that um, would be uh, the best for CKID and the setting uh, of, of our cohort. Um, so that's, uh, th that's why we opted to go with the, with the accelerometers. It, it offered, after speaking with Jennifer and Cyprian, the best way to measure physical activity in the real world and really understand how the children are moving um, in the context of their disease. So you mentioned that CKID was a large national study similar to ECHO. How do you believe your work in CKID and what you've learned from CKID can help benefit ECHO? Sure. Um, so I think the, um, the, the fact that there are multiple sites um, renders a level of complexity in terms of uh, having a standardized protocol and making sure all the sites adopt that protocol. Um, I think uh, the, one of the, the, the most important thing to remember is that planning uh, um, can overcome a lot of obstacles in the future. So the more you can plan and design a study properly up front, uh, the more chance it will have as, of success, Make especially when we're dealing with this large network of, of sites. Right, cool makes cohorts. sense. Good, good planning. Yes. <laughs> right. And so now if I look at the slide here, this, what is this? What are we looking at here? Yeah, uh, so I like this slide a lot because it shows two components of, of the study that we're trying to, to get at. The first is um, if you look at the bottom, there's a note written by one of the parents of our uh, participants, um, and this child has chronic kidney disease, and she, she's indicating uh, that uh, the child was not able to be very physically active because of a complication from her kidney disease. And this is important because this is exactly why we're trying to measure uh, physical activity in the first place. You know, how does the disease impact uh, uh, this child's uh, daily life and what she's able to do? Um, one of the, uh, the things that we also incorporate, and this is the second part, is the, um, uh, a diary at the, at the top, sort of like a log, um, kind of looks like a Google calendar where they can block out time and record how active they were um, in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, and, and, and going by uh, half hour increments. Um, this was useful uh, to provide a subjective measure because it may be that even though the children exhibit low levels of activity, their perceived exertion might be high. And this was a way to, uh, to uh, um, capture that. Um, this is a uh, subjective log that we send home with the participants and they fill it out as they, uh, as they go about their, their day. So with CKID, you had the accelerometer providing the objective data. You had the activity log or diary producing sort of subjective measures. And in addition, did you also have physical activity questionnaire data? And if so, how do you use all three types of data points? Right. So uh, we do also collect uh, uh, physical activity data in terms of how active was your child in the last month? How active would you, would you rate them? Um, we, we, we found that um, the objective measures um, provide a, a cornerstone between understanding the subjective perceived exertion um, from what the, the child or parent reports, as well as uh, a very general um, uh, question like how active was your child in the last 30 days, um, to understand, well, what does that mean for the family? What does that mean for the participant, knowing that this data is coming from 
uh, their activities at school or what they choose to participate in in their free time. Okay. Uh, Chiprian, can you tell me a little bit about the slide that we're seeing here? What is represented in those panels? Yes, as I discussed earlier, the accelerometer measures acceleration in three directions. And what you see here is basically a combination of a video that uh, we took of Derek while wearing an accelerometer. And uh, you see the video, and the same time the, the data are shown in the bottom panel indicating the various levels of activity and how they correspond to the actual video, to the actual activity that is happening. So we, Derek walked a little bit on the corridor and then um, you can see that that corresponds to higher level of amplitude in the signal indicating walking. And as Derek actually enters his uh, office and starts playing a game, <laughs> Uh, the level of activity starts to go down and it's less organized than it was before. There are three axes, three time series that you see colored differently because each one of them comes from one of the directions that I mentioned earlier about the accelerometer. Uh, so this is a three-dimensional uh, accelerometer and uh, the data that, that we observe is a combination of these high amplitudes, high density data and possibly the video data if we can get it in uh, either the lab or in the free living environment. Derek, do you want to take a moment and walk us through the video? Sure. Uh, so if you um, play the video again, um, you'll see me walking down, down the hall and the amount of um, activity that's generated by that walking, as Chiprian mentioned. Uh, and when I walk into the office, um, I take off my, uh, my jacket and then put the jacket back on again. And this represents uh, uh, sort of a mundane, normal activity that might be, um, that, uh, that, that might occur. Now, if, you, uh, if we pause it here, um, uh, what, what we wanted to show with this video was ha the impact of playing video games on the detection of physical activity. Um, one of the main concerns uh, that was raised by uh, an external panel when they were evaluating the protocol was that video games would be uh, uh, incorrectly classified as being vigorous activity because okay. the kids are, are playing hard and they're focused in and um, uh, their, their wrists are moving and that that would show up as being a very uh, 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 moderate to vigorous activity. Um, even though we know that if they're sitting on a couch playing video games that that doesn't qualify as what we think of as vigorous activity. So we wanted to do an experiment and explore this. So in this video, if you, if you start playing it, um, after I uh, put my jacket back on, I sit down and play a video game to understand exactly uh, what movement looks like when uh, the video games are being played. And this is something that I think is a, a real concern in a pediatric population, since video games are very ubiquitous. Um, and what we found was that there was actually very little movement, and this um, uh, objective measures from the uh, physical activity indicated that uh, I was, in fact, engaging in sedentary behavior. Um, what we found is that it was very difficult to focus on the game and move your wrists a lot because the game required uh, a still wrist to, um, to play effectively. I'm not very good at the, these video games, but my concentration meant that I had to keep my wrist still to, uh, uh, to, to hold it properly. We may also try some video games with dancing. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think, I think that's, um, that's something that would be considered, you know, potentially moderate to vigorous activity with a lot of movement. And that's something we would want to capture because there are video games now that try to encourage uh, physical activity. It could be an intervention in some studies. Yes. Good point. So all of you have considerable experience in using wearables as well as specifically accelerometers in research settings. So if, what would you be your words of wisdom to your younger self when you were first entering the world of wearables? What would you tell yourself and what have you learned through your research? Chiprian? I think uh, the most important component is to build a team uh, that brings together uh, diverse set of skills, to surround yourself with really good people who understand and are passionate about what they do, and to focus on understanding the measurements and 
how measurement is related to asking the questions. So in, in many situations, I've been faced with designing an experiment, and it helps d substantially if when you design the experiment, you actually think about what the problem is, what do you want to do, versus let me just deploy a particular type of wearable device. So understanding deeply what the problem is and trying to address that with the wearables instead of the other way around where I have a wearable, let me use it in a study. Jennifer? I would echo that for sure. Have a plan about what you want to measure and why you're trying to measure it. Are you interested in physical activity? Are you interested in sleep? Are you interested in both? And trying to plan when the participant's going to wear the device and for how long. And then what you're going to do with the data once it comes in. Um, that was one thing that we didn't have a plan about. I was just given a large data set and asked to look at the data. And that's when I started working with Chiprion because I couldn't even open the file because it was so large. So having a plan for the data, knowing how to process it, who's going to look at it, who's going to examine it, those are really important factors. And I think also remembering what you're actually measuring. You're measuring how much someone moves. You're not measuring things like steps. You're not measuring calories. You're really just measuring how much that person is moving. And whether you turn it into something like steps or, or calories is, is another endpoint, but really just understanding what it is that we're looking at with this data. And Derek? I would circle back to the planning phases. Um, I think one uh, thing that uh, we, we dealt with was understanding a pediatric um, uh, population compared to the more geriatric populations that, that you two deal with. We have unique uh, considerations for pediatric cohorts um, that are worth really thinking through. Um, for example, uh, one thing that we uh, uh, had to think about was dealing with school days and um, activities that uh, children are forced to do if they're <laughs> in gym or you know they're forced to, to participate in a particular activity um, that's different than uh, what they voluntarily choose to engage in and the log I showed you tried to um, uh, capture some of that uh, that heterogeneity in obligated activities and more voluntary activities um, these were things that we had to had to think through and understand what we wanted uh, for the pediatric uh, populations. Um, the other thing in terms of uh, planning uh, was very similar to what Chiprian said about surrounding yourself with people. We had uh, a couple coordinators uh, invest a lot of time developing protocols and uh, manuals of procedures so that all uh, 56 sites of CKID um, would uh, be properly placing the devices, briefing the participant consistently um, and in a standardized way. Um, and we found that the amount of investment in that manual of procedures has paid a lot of dividends uh, towards the success of the study. So to summarize, a similar sentiment that I've heard from each of the three of you was the importance of planning as well as the importance of assembling a quality um, team so that you have the appropriate study design that you have identified your specific research questions and goals to understand your study population Derek you mentioned specific considerations regarding pediatric research also what wearable or specifically what type of accelerometer do you want to object use to objectively measure physical health and where are you going to put that wearable and then Jen you brought up again sort of the amount of data that you have being generated by this accelerometer and what to do with it and to plan appropriately in terms of how to do your data analysis. Thank you Chiprian, Jennifer, and Derek for your participation in providing insight into the use of wearables and specifically the use of accelerometers to capture objective physical activity data in health-related research. For the viewers, if you have questions or would like additional information on the use of wearables, including accelerometers, in your ECHO cohort, please contact the DAC at echodac at rti.org. The DAC and the ECHO Wearables Task Force have experts in many wearable devices and are available to help you design your specific study to answer your research questions, as well as to provide assistance regarding analyzing the objective data obtained by using wearables. Thank you for joining us today.